tale of two men. For those of you that don't know what the Psalms are, they are what we would consider uh, the hymn book of the Old Testament. There were many different earthly authors, though all of the Psalms are inspired by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we know that ultimately God is the author of the Psalms, but they have been expressed and written down through different men throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament. There were, uh, David seems to be the author of most of the Psalms. These were songs, these were prayers, uh, these were prophecies written. And we find ourselves this morning in the very first one. And Psalm 1 is very unique. It doesn't have a title. And we don't know who the earthly author is. There's some, the main two beliefs are that it was either King David who wrote Psalm 2, believing that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 at one point went together. Um, some also believe it was quite possibly Ezra, Old Testament. But either way, we don't know. All we know for sure is that it was definitely the Holy Spirit who wrote it. But one of the interesting things about Psalm 1 is it stands as a prologue. It's really the gateway into understanding the Psalms. So however this appeared as Psalm 1, it was genius. Because Psalm 1 is in itself, and under, gives us a better understanding of all of the rest of the Psalms that you read. It really divides life down into two categories. The righteous and the wicked. The blessed and the cursed. I mean, it really shows us right at the very beginning as we open that front gate of the Psalms and we look, we see clearly in Psalm 1 an outline for all of the other 149 other Psalms that we find in the poetry section of God's Word. And I want you, I want to follow along. It is a very short Psalm. It is only six verses. But I believe God has some big things planned out of these six small verses. It says in verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Psalm 1 not only opens as a prologue to understanding and and being able to study the rest of the Psalms, giving us a framework by which to look at them, it also starts out much like Jesus did in His ministry, starting out with the words blessings. I love it that God's Word, when we're first introduced to this Psalm of poetry, this part of the wisdom section of Scripture, the very first words we encounter as we open up to them is the word blessed. We get to realize and pause for just a moment to remember that we have a God, we worship a God, we love a God, we call out on a God that longs to bless His people. He wants to bless us. When we are not experiencing or not recognizing the blessings of God in our life, it's not for any other reason than we, than, than we know that He wants to do it. There may be something standing in our life. There may be sin in our life. There may be something that has hindered us from being able to receive those blessings, but we know that at the heart of God is a desire to bless His people. And it starts out, blessed is the man. Actually, interestingly enough, the word blessed in the Hebrew is actually in plural. Man is singular. What it's literally saying are blessings are on the man. Blessings, multiple, manifold different types of blessings are on the man. And I want us to look at the man. Because this is, this morning, a tale of two men. For some of you, you may, you, you're here, you're a woman, you're saying this doesn't have any effect on me. It does. Man, in this sense, is, is singular. We're not just looking at man as far as your genetic makeup, but we're looking at the individual. A tale of two individuals. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, 
nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. This man is blessed, interestingly enough, because of what he doesn't do. That's what's mentioned first. You would think that, and we think oftentimes in our life, that our blessings come by what we do. That God, if I just do this, if I'm just more obedient in this sense, if I'm active in my obedience, then the blessings are going to come. And that can be true as well. But in this sense, the psalmist starts out by saying, blessed is the man who does not do these things. And if you go back and you remember the Old Testament, you reminded that the Ten Commandments were a list of things that we were to not do. They were, they were do not. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Those were things that we were called to stay away from and to, to abstain from. So here, what we find is this first man, this man that is blessed, the blessed man, chooses his friends carefully. If you're taking notes, I want, to, I want you to jot down a few of these characteristics. This is a man that chooses his friends carefully. It says in, in Psalm 1 that he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not stand in the way of sinners, nor is he sit in the seat of the scornful. You'll notice that there is a progression in this man's life. All three of the descriptions of the people that he does not bring into his inner circle, the wicked, the scornful, those are people that he has chosen to stay away from. He has chosen to not take counsel from them. He has chosen to not walk in their ways. He has chosen to not bring them in to his inner circle of wisdom or counsel. He's not going to take their advice. He has someone better to take his advice from. So if you notice this progression, he doesn't take counsel. He doesn't walk. He doesn't stand. He doesn't sit. There's this progression that we understand as there are people that we can build a relationship with and we can stand and talk to them and get to know them, and then before long we can walk with them and start going in the way that they're going, and then before long we find ourselves sitting with them, which always represents either fellowship or rule. Sitting always represents fellowship or rule in God's Word as far as the picture is concerned. So this guy is one who's not even beginning to start that relationship because he knows where they're going. He knows what their guidance is. He knows where they draw their decisions. From, and he doesn't want any part of it. He wants to stay away from it. You know, outside of Jesus Christ, outside of your personal relationship to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, I can think of no more important decision in life than who you're going to marry. That one decision outside of Jesus Christ of who you're going to marry can bring with it the most good or the most bad in your life. The, the, the biggest decisions we make in life are not economic. They're not professional. They're not necessarily psychological. The, the, the biggest decisions we make in life are relational. Who am I going to bring into my life? Who am I going to become a friend with? Who am I going to marry? Who am I going to walk with in this life? Who am I going to take counsel from? Who am I going to allow to speak truth into my life? If we would pay closer attention to the relationships in our life and take a page out of the Psalms and understand that the blessed man chooses carefully who he's going to spend time with. Chooses carefully who he's going to receive instruction from. Chooses carefully who he's going to join to and walk with. We would do well to do the same thing. He does not walk in the counsel of the of the wicked. He does not stand in the way of sinners. And he does not sit in the seat of scornful. These are people who are against God. These are people who have abandoned God's Word. These are people who do not consider anything about God to be worthy of their attention. It does say what his, where He runs. It does say where He looks. We all need advice. We all need counsel. We all need wisdom. And it says in verse 2, but His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on His law He meditates day and night. This guy loved God's Word. For this guy that's blessed, it was not just something he read out of duty. For this guy, it was like ice cream. I mean, for this guy, 
the way I understand this and the way I read this, this guy would approach the Word of God like a steak dinner. I mean, he could not wait to sink his teeth into that steak. He could not wait. As when it came time for him to read the Word, to spend time in God's Word, I would imagine his spiritual, his soul would salivate just thinking of the promises. I mean, just thinking that God's law helps me understand who He is. In God's law, I see His holiness. In God's law, I see His mercy. In God's law, I see His standard. This man loved God and therefore loved His Word. This is not a natural response of man to God's Word. It is not natural for us to desire the things of God. It is not natural for us to want to read and, and, and meditate and chew on and think on and consider and roll over and apply God's Word. That is not natural. The natural man cannot receive the things of God. They are foolishness to him, the Scriptures tell us. This man loves God and loves His Word. You've heard me say this before, but it bears repeating. If we really love God, aren't we also going to love the things of God? I love my children. And therefore, I love the things of my children. I love my wife. Therefore, I love the things of my wife. I love it that she burps louder than anybody else in the house. That's a true story. That's all entirely true. You probably never heard it because she does understand that's not for everyone. That's in our home, not at the table. That's a tickle family rule on the wall. No burping at the table. Mommy. Guys, if we really say we love God but we don't love His Word, in all honesty... We really need to be able to go back and ask ourselves the hard question. How can I not love God and not, how can I say that I love God and yet not love His communication to me? How can I truly say that I love God, but I don't love learning more about Him? How can I truly say, and you may say, well, Pastor, I don't understand it. The Word of God is hard to understand, and you're right, it is. But a person that really loves God and really loves His Word yet struggles to understand it is going to find a teacher. That person is going to seek out somebody. They're going to come to somebody and say, I really want to understand the Word. Can you help me? They're going to find themselves in a class. I'm going to be getting emails from people saying, Pastor, I love God and I really love the Word, but I can't understand it. Can I get with you or somebody else to help me understand it? If you really love God, you're not going to stop pursuing it. Even if you don't understand it, you're going to work hard to be able to find somebody to be able to come along. You're going to be looking for resources, talking about resources to help you understand it. This man that was blessed loved God. He chose his friends carefully. But he loved the Word. He delighted in it. He meditated on it. Look at verse 3. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water. That one little section has a whole lot to it. This man had a sense of purpose in life, if you're taking notes. This was not a tree that came up accidentally. This wasn't a tree that just started to sprout at the river's edge. The Scriptures make it clear for us that this man is like a tree that has been planted. Thought, forethought, consideration of God about this man has come to the point that God has planted that man right where he needed to be. That man can know whatever season, whatever scenario he is in in life. He can lift his eyes up to the holy and say, God, I know you have a purpose for me here. Because you planted me. You dug a hole. You made space for me. You set me down here. And you put me right where I need to be. Right by 
the rivers, the streams of water. Water is life-giving. Without water, this whole thing comes crashing to a halt. We have to have water. And this plant, friends, if you're wanting to know what heaven is like, one of our Sunday school classes, women's Sunday school classes, doing a study on heaven. You want to know what heaven for a tree is? It's being planted by streams of water. You want to know what heaven for a sheep is? It's the green grass, right? Right by the still waters, that Psalm 23. That, that's heaven for a sheep. This is heaven for a plant. And us in our life, when we know that we have made our relationship right with God, and we are loving His Word, and we're walking in His Word, we're seeking to, to push aside all the counsel that goes against God's Word, and we're clinging to God's Word, we can know that in life, no matter where I'm at, no matter what is going on, no matter what the political climate, no matter what the scenario is in my job. I'm planted. I have purpose. But I'm planted by streams of water. I have provision. God has made it possible for me to be able to thrive in this environment. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter is speaking to believers in his second letter that have been persecuted and dispersed. And right in, after the introduction. He says these words, that His divine power, God through Jesus, His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You know what Peter was reminding those believers? God has given you what you need to be all that He's called you to be. God has given you everything you need to be all that He has called you to be. Through Jesus Christ. This man loves God. And in his love of God, there are things he will not do. People he will not follow. His life has purpose. It has provision. And probably my favorite part is that it yields its fruit in its season. Another description of this man is his life produces fruit. We have a tree, we have a compost pile by our garden. And that thing has had everything thrown in it. Everything. And, I don't know, probably three years ago, the boys and I had a bunch of peach pits. And we took them out and we planted them throughout the yard. And we never, we kept watching them, you know, look, nothing would come up. Well, right out by our compost pile, there's this tree that's growing. And I got giddy. Because I think it's a peach tree. But I have thought that before and been wrong. I have Googled it. I have compared leaves. I have done investigation on the bark. I'm telling you, it's been extensive at Big T Ranch. I want a peach tree. And I'm so excited to think that this thing is a peach tree. And my kids keep saying, Daddy, look at our peach tree. It's growing. I said, Son, we don't know that it's a peach tree yet. Well, when are we going to know? I said, When it produces peaches. That's the only time I'm going to know that this thing is a peach tree because I have been burned several times before thinking it was and it turned out. I still don't even know what that other tree was. You know what's interesting about this idea of fruit? This man doesn't manufacture that fruit. The tree doesn't manufacture fruit. Fruit is a natural byproduct of a growing, living, healthy plant. In our life, this guy, this blessed guy, has fruit growing out of his life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's what Paul said in Galatians is the fruit of the Spirit. This man, just by living, just by drawing down deep into that stream's water and pulling it up through his roots, he is now producing fruit. There is fruit coming from his life. You want to know something else great about fruit? It has within it a seed. Fruit is a way of that seed being able to come out. And every one of those seeds, every one of the plants that produces fruit has the ability within it to reproduce itself. What I believe we're looking at here is not just a man who chose to not go down a certain path. 
who said no to this way and yes to God's way. A day-to-day decision. I'm not taking that counsel. I'm taking God's counsel. I'm not listening to where the, what they're saying. I'm going to follow God. This man who makes that decision is not just blessed. But I believe with this idea of fruit, we're introduced to another generation. This man has fruit, not just fruit of the Spirit, but there's a second generation now introduced. Those kids are coming into a family with the man who stands at the helm that says there is a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. That that fruit look up underneath this giant, strong tree planted by the river. And they see a man who is uncompromising. They see a man who loves God who searches His Word. They see a man who has done so much in his life to provide an example for that next generation. Every tree has within it the ability to reproduce itself. His life is prosperous. It says, the leaf will not wither. More than likely, this is speaking about a pine tree, a Mediterranean pine tree, or quite possibly a palm tree. Think about this for a minute, men, women. This man's life, while everything else is dried up, while everything else is dying and choking for thirst, this man's green leaves and fruit show life. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 44, a tree is known by its fruit. You see, the only way I know that that's a peach tree is when it produces peaches. I can look at the leaves, but they're deceiving. But there's no denying when that fruit comes on, that's a peach. Leaves and fruit are a means of identification. How you live. How you are viewed by others is a representation of what really exists in here. Jesus told us we can't get thorns from thistles. or We can't get berries from thistles. Thorn plants are going to grow thorns. Grapes are going to come from grapevines. Fruit and the leaf serve as an identifier of what's in that man. Let me recap. He chooses his friends carefully. He loves God's Word. He has has a purpose. He has provision. He produces fruit. He is prosperous. For those of you that think I'm speaking of a prosperity gospel, you are wrong. The prosperity that I'm speaking of in this Scripture is one that has life when everything else is dead. This is a man who sacrifices. This is a man who serves. This is a man who is set apart. This is a man that you and I would walk by and not consider to be rich by the world standards necessarily, but rich when it comes to God. This is a man who understands his moral standing. This is a man who is of high caliber when it comes to integrity. That's this man not going to deviate from the Word of God. Now look at the description in verse 4 of the wicked. The wicked are not so. Actually, in the original it says this. Not so, the wicked, not so. There's a double on the not so. What the writer is trying to do is to say, I'm painting for you a picture of what this man, what this individual looks like. What he does, how God interacts with him, and all that he has. I'm going to draw this picture for you. And we see in our mind's eye this stream, and this proud, tall, lively, living, vibrant tree, full of fruit. We see that, and then all of a sudden the psalmist says, for the wicked, not so. So immediately in our mind, the stream goes away. Immediately, the leaves shrivel. Immediately, the fruit falls off, rotten, and the tree becomes scrawny. That's what we see. 
When he says, not so the wicked, not so, he is literally saying, everything I have said about the righteous, everything I have said about the blessed man is not so for this guy. This is a guy who takes counsel from the wicked. This is a guy who begins to walk in their ways. This is a guy who begins to sit with the scornful who speak against God rather than to glorify Him. This is a man who has no purpose in life. This is a man who would never imagine prosperity, true, lasting, eternal prosperity to come to his life. This is a man of not any moral foundation. This is a man that many of us probably know They've disregarded God, disregarded His Word. And what we see in the Scripture is the psalmist is saying, I'm telling you, there are two men. There are not three, four, or five different categories. There are two. There's one who loves God and one who doesn't. And this is there in the no, not so the wicked are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Notice the parallel. If you don't know what chaff is, It is everything that is left over that is of no use and no value after the wheat harvest. It is small. It is an outer skin of the kernel that is worth something. So on one side, we see this giant tree, vibrant and alive. The righteous. Well watered, bearing fruit. Yet on the other side, small, insignificant, purposeless, wind blown, leftover pieces of dead wheat. This description is intended to be drastic. And there should be a drastic difference between the blessed and the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. The tree that could withstand even the strongest of winds because of its deep roots. Planted. Sure. Secure. Not so. Not so. The wicked, not so. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Don't mistake that word stand in verse This verse with verse 1. When he's speaking of the wicked not standing in judgment, what he means is this. The wicked will be absolutely overcome in the judgment. The wicked will not be able to defend himself in the judgment. He has scorned, scoffed the Word of God. And one day he will be judged by the Word of God. And he will not stand. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, once that chaff chaff is blown away, we immediately move into the judgment. Once his life is removed and he is forgotten and is no more, he has a date with God. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. That is one of the most incredible thoughts I can imagine in my mind. I can't imagine as a believer what it's going to be like when I behold the face of God. And and I know we've had some amazing worship times here together. There have been times I have been literally felt like I was brought right to the throne room. I can't imagine what that's going to be like. I don't have to sing. I don't have to have faith. I just exist. And He's there. And I'm thankful that I know that when I stand before God as a believer, I will either gain or lose rewards because of my life. What I did with what Christ gave me for His glory. 
but equally awesome. I cannot imagine what it will be like for the person who has rejected God's sacrifice through Jesus for him. Imagine with me for a moment what that would be like to stand before God and give an account of every sin you've ever committed before a holy God. My mind is beyond my ability to comprehend. But right now today, there are Millions that are doing just that. Their time on earth is over. They have given up the ghost. And they go immediately to stand before an almighty, holy God. Church, if that doesn't cause us to want to share the Gospel, If that doesn't light our evangelistic fire, our wood is wet. Praise God, as believers, we don't have to imagine that because it is not for us as saved. They will not go into the congregation of the righteous. I believe this congregation He is speaking of is when we are all gathered together in one place. All of the righteous from the four corners of the earth are brought together at one place and I believe that place is heaven. They will not go into that place. There is a different destination for them. Let me back this all up to the very beginning. The psalmist has taken us on a journey of two very different men. That ended up in two very different places. But when you begin to walk back up, backwards through the psalm, you realize that that journey started by their relationships. The blessed man does not take the counsel of the ungodly. He does not walk in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scornful. That man ended up where he did because of how he started. Today, right now, where are you with God? There are not three or four or five or ten different men spoken of here. There are the lost and the saved. The righteous and the wicked. The blessed and the cursed. Which one of these is ours? One prospers, one perishes. The most important decision outside of Christ you will ever make are your relationships. Young people, you have so much of the trajectory of life still in front of you. Your decision on who you take counsel from. Your decisions now are exponentially greater because of the lasting impact they have on you. Dads, is this you? Is this me? Are we different? We love God's Word. I hope that us, I hope that we are all like trees, planted by that water, bearing fruit, prospering in our families.